the, uh, the Reverend Eugene James entered the house. I have, I have a little story before I pray and before I preach, but uh, Eugene and I uh, were at preaching camp uh, earlier this week, and we both preached sermons, had, write, had to write and preach sermons from the book of Revelation. Eugene got to preach on the glories of the kingdom uh, and the, the beauties of that, and I got to preach about the vultures eating the bodies of the slain. That's not what I'm preaching this morning. I, though, I, though Eugene, if, if I had Eugene's text, maybe. So I had to write a different sermon. Would you pray with me? Wondrous God, we give thanks to you this day that we might enter into your spirit and know your peace and know what you would have for us as we seek to live out your, our faith in the world. May the words of our mouths and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Growing up, my mother drilled into me that it was unbecoming of a young man to use what we would call swear words. And I seem to have learned the lesson well. While these words have become commonplace in our culture, they've never been part of my vocabulary. So thanks, Mom. So as Brett and I were driving across the country, and we talked about a number of things, when you drive 2,300 miles over four days, you will talk once in a while. And so as we drove across the country, this topic came up. And it seems that Cheryl and I have conveyed the same message to Brett. And these words are not necessarily part of his vocabulary. That, however, doesn't mean that any of us, including myself, are perfect in the way we speak. I might not use those swear words, but I have said things that are inappropriate, and I've said things that could be destructive, and so I too am a sinner, as we all are. And it's with that note that we turn to the book of James and the word we have heard read for us this morning. And in the first chapter of the book of James, we hear if anyone appears to be religious but do, cannot control his tongue, he deceives himself, and we may be sure that his religion is useless. I use the Phillips translation because I like that phrase, his religion, the religion part being useless. If we can't control our tongues, our faith, our religion is useless. James made that comment as he tried to define a religion that was pure and undefiled before God. And besides controlling or bridling the tongue, controlling is the Phillips translation, bridling is, is the translation from the NRSV, he added caring for widows and orphans and keeping oneself unstained from the world. So the word that we have for this morning is watch what you say. Watch what you say. When we got to chapter 2 last Sunday, we encountered Jesus' royal law. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. And now in chapter 3, James returns to the use of the tongue. He directs his attention, as you can see, to teachers and, by way of expansion, preachers who are charged with leading congregations with their words. And apparently, according to James, this is a dangerous occupation because teachers and preachers will be judged with greater strictness. And since it is in my job description to both to preach and to teach, I will take this word from James under advisement. And I will try as best I can, God willing, to be careful with my words. Now, James had people like me in mind when he wrote that phrase in that chapter of chapter 3. But I think it's appropriate to extend the use, his words about the use of the tongue, to cover other speakers. Because words have consequences. 
And as the gospel song puts it, it only takes a spark to get a fire going. Now, I know that Kurt Kaiser had something else in mind when he wrote that song, but I think it's appropriate. Those words are appropriate for what James has in mind. So, sparks, fire. I grew up, of course, on the West Coast where forest and grass fires are commonplace. And I heard the message with regularity from Smokey the Bear, who would appear in Forest Service ads telling us, only you can prevent forest fires. How many of you remember hearing that? Okay, so it's not just those of us who grew up on the West Coast. But Smokey the Bear was a constant companion for me growing up. We learned early on that a cigarette butt thrown out a car window could have disastrous effects. And the same was true of a small campfire left unattended. Just a small gust of wind could, could lift a spark into the trees or into the grass, setting off a fire that could cause great destruction and more. What was true back then growing up is even more true today as temperatures soar and drought dries out the land. And over the last two, three, four years, uh, my homeland uh, of Oregon and Northern California has, and even Southern California has, seems like it's a, summer is a constant time of fire. I don't remember it being like that quite the same growing up. So here we have a word about sparks and fire, and somehow that applies to the tongue. It's good to remember that a spark is a very small element of fire. It's small, but as James points out, small things have great power. Just think of a microscopic pathogen that enters the body, causing sickness and more can be passed on to others, causing an epidemic. I discovered or heard that one of the dangers from the flooding connected to Hurricane Florence is the presence of E. coli and other bacteria that's in the water. And so just simply wading through the water, those flood waters, could cause sickness and more. So yes, it only takes a, fi- a spark to get a fire going. Now, James, sometimes we avoid James because well, James can be a little bit harsh and James can kind of seem like he meddles, but I think he understands human nature. He probably observed the dangerous power of the tongue operating in the church. In fact, that's probably why he wrote this. And maybe he observed it in himself. I know that I have observed its dangerous powers in my own life even if I do refrain from using those unbecoming words that my mother taught me not to use. And I expect that we've all been victims of somebody else's loose lips, and we've also probably been perpetrators. It might be a flippant remark about someone's weight, or their clothing, or the way they performed a particular task, And even if we didn't mean to be malicious, we may have humiliated the person. Remember that old saying that we learned as children? Sticks and stones may break my bones, but names will never hurt me. I can tell you from personal experience that names do hurt. And they can hurt deeply. They can leave lasting scars and even destroy lives. This was true back when I was growing up, and it remains true today. In fact, today the the power, the dangerous power of those kinds of words can be extended through social media. The, The range is extended just about anywhere in the world. It's commonplace to hear about a young person committing suicide after a rumor gets spread about that person upon, on social media. And it doesn't matter whether the message is true or not. The fact that it got spread around so widely and so quickly 
damage that person's self-image, and in their embarrassment, they decide to kill themselves. And that in itself should be a warning about the power of the tongue. And I would be remiss if I didn't address the power of gossip. And when it comes to gossip, I expect we're all sinners. It's difficult not to share that juicy tidbit that comes our way. It might start innocently, but you know how things get out of hand quickly. One of the best illustrations of how this works is the game telephone. Many of us have played that, uh, that game at some point in time. And so you gather, if you remember, you gather in a circle and one person tells the secret to the, their neighbor who then tells it to the one and it goes around until it comes back to the person who started it. So the word at first might be that, uh, that Joe's uh, cousin, Jennifer, is coming to visit him. That was, the, that was the word, the secret. But by the time it gets back to the person who gave the first word, well, Joe is now having an affair with a woman named Jennifer. He's about to divorce his wife, leaving his, his three uh, children and his wife destitute. How did it change? Well, we want to add to it. It's easy to do. So you can see how dangerous the tongue can be. It may be small, but it can set a forest, fi forest on fire. I was looking at different texts, and, and uh, I, I turned to the Wisdom of Sirach. It's not a text we normally look at. It didn't, it's a wisdom book that didn't make it into the canon. But I think it was known to James, and it offers helpful words of advice that parallels what James has to say. In fact, I think James would know this saying from the Wisdom of Sirach. If you blow on a spark, it will glow. If you spit on it, it will be put out. Yet both come out of your mouth. Curse the gossips and the double-tongued, for they destroy the peace of many. And Paul, remember Paul? Paul lists gossiping among the expressions of wickedness that is present in the world. And he adds it to things like murder and envy and strife and a whole other longer list of things that we ought not to do. So maybe gossip is a serious sin. So I think as we listen to James, this is one of those words that does apply to us in our day, in our time. I think the fact that James is speaking powerfully to us Sparks have been fanned into forest fires. With the same tongue that we bless God, we may find ourselves cursing our neighbor created in the image of God. <clears throat> and again, here's where James meddles. I think he puts his finger on one of the great dangers of our day, and that danger is the growing belief that people have the right to say whatever they want, whenever they want, and wherever they want. A certain crassness dominates many conversations in our day. It could be in our personal conversations, but it might also be shared on Twitter or Facebook. And this crassness, it can destroy individual lives and communities. Defenders of this form of freedom of speech say it's a reaction to political correctness. People are tired of being told what they can say and what they cannot say. But as Paul puts it, all things are lawful, but not all things are beneficial. All things are lawful, but not all things build up. And I think James would agree. Unfortunately, this spirit of crassness has started in the president's office and has permeated the country. Now, the president didn't create it or invent it or start it. But he has embodied it, and he has modeled it for others, and it's given permission for many to say things that they probably wouldn't have in previous years. And this is not about politics. This is just about how we live our lives in the world. The spark has been lit, and the fire is burning. And I can tell you, with the political season underway over the next 60 days or so, we're going to see a whole lot more of it. 
So be prepared, but don't be influenced by it. So as we consider the state of our conversations, James leaves us with this warning. The tongue is a fire. The tongue is placed among our members as a world of iniquity. It stains the whole body, sets on fire the cycle of nature. And here's the kicker and is itself set on fire by hell. Even though we can tame animals, James says, no one can tame the tongue, which is a restless evil and full of deadly poison. But then again, as James wrote in in chapter 1, if we are to be truly religious, we're going to have to learn to bridle the tongue. We're going to have to learn to tame it. The choice, it seems, is ours. While the tongue is a restless evil, that we use to bless God and curse our neighbors, this isn't how it's supposed to be. As James puts it, a fig tree can't produce both figs and olive. A spring can't produce both clear water and brackish water. And therefore, it is inappropriate for us to sing the praises of God and then turn around and curse our neighbor. They don't go together. So what is the cure? In the context of James, the cure is love your neighbor as yourself. Put yourself in your neighbor's shoes. Think of them and their welfare. And then maybe you'll learn to time the tongue. That's the word I hear from James spoken to me. And if we can do that, if we can bridle the tongue, then we will have moved a long way toward a religion that is pure and undefiled before God.